them, I will proceed. Um, so there's no getting around it that, that dealing with the skippers is tough, but of course that's what field guides are for. Uh, but it can get pretty intimidating to make a deep dive into those back pages of your, your favorite field guide. So I'm going to help out a little bit. I've drawn out a lot of the information that's just waiting for you there. And I hope that as we go along, after you've seen some of this information, uh, dealing with skippers in the field will be a, a lot more enjoyable um, and a lot less intimidating. Now we're going to be go, going over identification characteristics, but I certainly not have have not developed these on my own. Um, I'm a big user of field guides, and of course, since 1992. Uh, we've been using Jeff Glassberg's series of butterflies to binocular field guides, uh, and his latest is the Swift Guide to Butterflies in North America. Uh, all of these are pretty much indispensable. Um, they, they started the whole um, hobby of, butterf of recreational butterflying, and they're really difficult to get along without them. A wholly different book, not a field guide, is Butterflies of the East Coast by Rick Check and Guy Tudor. This is a large format book with uh, just tons of information on butterfly life histories and biology and ecology, as well as uh, identification. It's not something you carry in the field, but it's, it's a, a wonderful book, just crammed full of information uh, that I find also indispensable. Uh, we have many contributing photographers here. Uh, I, Wade and I did, certainly did not take all these photos ourselves. Uh, we're Really lucky to have many wonderful photographers in the club uh, and some uh, additional friends who are willing to share uh, their photographs. And I do thank them all. And that just, I just want to point out that using a camera can be one of the great um, tools to help you with your, your identifications. All your identification doesn't literally have to be in the field. You can use a camera to take photos of skippers or other butterflies. Uh, that you don't uh, recognize, bring them home and then whip out your field guide and you can compare your photos with field guide photos. And that's a great way to um, help study uh, all butterflies. Uh, camera, digital cameras are just one of the greatest inventions for, uh, for naturalists. So if you're not taking photographs, you might consider that. Okay, so what makes a butterfly a grass skipper? Uh, as I said, we have about 30 species in New Jersey, so it helps to know what you're looking at from the start. Uh, most skippers are small, and typically when they're resting, they are in what's called the jet fighter pose. Rather than having their wings closed over their back or spread out flat, they have the hind wing flat and the forewing on a 45 degree angle. Some of them raise the forewing a little bit higher but that's typically looks like a little jet fighter ready to take off. And often when they're in this pose can be one of the most difficult angles to identify them. It gets fairly easy to identify them from below, but from above, um, it, there's a lot of confusion. Uh, but let's just let me go over some of the um, uh, body parts and identification marks <coughs> that we'll be using. Uh, first of all, the costa of the forewing is the outer edge and also very often this area in here just below the actual edge is considered or described as the costa. Toward the outer portion of the wing are some, some species have two or three spots that are called the bracelet because they're sort of at where the wrist would be if this were an arm. You can see the little bend to the wing there. Uh, there are fringes to the wings, which sometimes the color of the fringes is important in differentiating species. Uh, going around the hind wing also has a costa, its outer margin. And then we get to the cell spot. Uh, some species have diagnostic or helpful spots somewhere in the cell, and the, which I'll get to in just a minute. Let me point out the stigma of the male first. Um, all, skip, all male skippers, nah, take it back. Many male skippers have a stigma, which is a patch of uh, scent producing cells in the forewing used in uh, courtship and mating. And it's usually a black mark across the forewing. Um, other butterfly 
butterflies and other families do not have stigmas. And let's go back to spatulate and kennel club. You can kind of see this regular, uh, regular. Other butterflies, other than the skippers, have a straight antenna stalk with a little rounded club at the end, not quite a knob, but a little extended club. And skippers, this is sort of spoon shaped. It's sort of like an elongated spoon and has a little hook on the end, which you can see a little better on this uh, male over here. Um, many skippers have a very long abdomen compared to the length of the wings. Wings tend to be on the small side. Most larvae, most, the larvae of all skippers, grass skippers feed on either grasses or sedges. That's not exclusive to skippers, but it's uh, characteristic of skippers. And, oh yeah, uh, Wade wants me to point out the fact that every photo in here has initials on it that identify the photographer that you, from the list that you saw early on, and hopefully you can translate the initials into names. Um, let me get back to cell spot. Uh, what is the cell to begin with? Oh, I <laughs> forgot this, tricky to identify. The last uh, characteristic of skippers. But the cell spot uh, is part, it's, uh, falls in an area of venation on the forewing. Uh, all butterflies have their wings divided into sections by veins and uh, in the forewing and hindwing, there's a sort of a central section that's, we'll say circular, but it's, it's usually rather elongated. And you can see this is on this skipper over here, there's quite a long cell. And the central spot, this would be called a mid-cell spot. And sometimes there are end-of-cell spots or a cell end bar. Uh, so that will become a characteristic that we mention occasionally. So moving on, uh, again, this is in more or less chronological order. Uh, I'm going over now the skippers that start flying in April and May. They may not, you know, most of them don't finish flying within that time period, but they start. And many other species that we'll deal with next time, they all start later than May. So the very first skipper that we're, uh, privilege to see every spring is the cobweb skipper. Uh, this is some uh, species that's not going to just show up anywhere. You happen to be uh, butterflying in North Jersey, particularly you have to make kind of a special trip to find the dry um, habitat that cobweb skippers like. Um, typically like a power line with uh, blue stem grasses growing in it, dry, disturbed, in the South Jersey fire prone habitats and they, they tend to be much more common in South Jersey. But cobweb skippers below brownish and their, their namesake marks are these combined white spots forming a chevron and the white also extends along the veins so it gives it a cobwebby appearance. But notice that there's quite a bit of variability in how much of a pattern there is. Uh, and it's not necessarily connected with sex. You know, these are a mated pair. So that's cobweb below. Uh, cobweb above, here's the male. Here's a costa, the ed edge of the forewing. Uh, both males and females have a white costal margin. And the male has a stigma and a rather uh, vague, as I say, orange field. It's not a really sharply defined orange field surrounding that stigma. And he has sort of a, what this mark is also, this little white mark, often referred to as a keyhole spot at the end of the stigma. The, the female above looks darker than the male. And like many grass skippers, the female has a pattern of white spots uh, across the forewing. And in her case, they are rather jagged looking spots. And a little hard to see, but there are a couple of little spots in the cell up here. And on the hind wings, there's a slight mirror or ghost of the ventral pattern, the ventral chevron. So that is cobweb below. And note the cobweb is going to fly to early June, from early April to early June, peaking in May. So that's our earliest skipper. A little later comes 
but in similar habitats comes dusted skipper. Uh, really beautiful skipper, really dark, rich brown with beautiful frosting when fresh on the uh, outer portions of both wings. Uh, in the northern populations that we have up here in Jersey, there's a basal dot on the hind wing. And the facial pattern is distinctive, uh, both from, from below and when, if you're standing above it when it's uh, open, you can see a distinctive white eyebrow. And if you're at ideal uh, position, you can see that the palps, the mouth parts, are white also. And harder to see is that this is actually a black bar in front of the eye, so it gives it a little masked appearance. But in practice, even with binoculars, you kind of don't notice that. You notice the white eyebrow. Below, they're not real um, spectacular. Excuse me, above, they're not real spectacular. A kind of a dingy brown color. The male has a few weak white marks in the forewing and the female is a little more boldly patterned. But notice how you can see those white eyebrows very distinctively. Um, and you can see, the, uh, particularly on this male, you can see the white costal line from above. Doesn't show too well. That's the kind of thing that may wear off as the butterfly ages a little bit. Uh, something you have to be aware of that markings may change a little bit uh, with wear on a butterfly. Getting into um, a familiar pair, maybe to most of us, a familiar pair of butterflies, uh, Hobomach and Zabulon. Uh, these are May flyers, a uh, Hobomach a little earlier than Zabulon, uh, but note that Zabulon goes much longer. You're not gonna see Hobomach after early July. So once you get into midsummer, um, there should be a question about whether you're seeing one or the other if you're still confused about them after this presentation. <laughs> uh, but both the male and standard female Hobomach have a big yellow patch on the hind wing below, a little frosting on the outer portions of both wings, um, and no, no dots in the yellow field compared to Zabulon, which to me is Zabulon always oh, just looks yellow. From any distance without your binoculars on it, you see a flash of bright yellow. And when you get a closer look at it, you can see that there are uh, random spots within the yellow patch. There's a little yellow at the tip of the forewing, which no, this hobo doesn't have. And Zabulon also has a yellow shoulder patch. And that's the male. Now the female Zabulon is much different. It's a beautiful little butterfly, one of my favorites. It's this beautiful mahogany brown. It's this reddish, rich reddish brown that just stands out. And it's highlighted by frosting on the outer portion of the wings. But the critical and most useful um, mark is this white upper, white edge to the upper hind wing. That really stands out. Even when it's pretty worn, uh, you can pick out the white hind wing edge on a Zabulon female. Hobo, ha Hobo mock has a, um, somewhat similar female form called Pocahontas. Uh, it's a different shade of brown. It's, it's brown. It's not that beautiful rich mahogany color. Um, and of course it lacks the outer uh, white edge to the hind wing. So that's all of them below. Above, um, male Hobomock has a patch in the hind wing that reflects what you see uh, from underneath, and it has rather um, straight edged, uh, blocky looking uh, segments to this patch in the hind wing. And there's no extension of this outer uh, uh, segment of the, of the marking, uh, which you do see in Zabulon. This is not the greatest um, example here, but some have a really distinctive pointed hook uh, or extension to the yellow patch. Hobomock has dark veins through the patch in the hind wing, which Zabulon lacks. And that's, that's probably the easiest way to tell basking Hobomock from Zabulon. I always look for the black veins in the hind wing. The, uh, the four wing marks are not as distinctive. Hobomock has a somewhat curved looking cell end bar. That's another cell marking. Here's this, this is the cell here, oops. <laughs> it's hard for me to do this evenly 
that's the cell and this is the cell end mark. Whereas it's rather than curved, it's more straight looking in Zabulon. But that's, that's not the kind of mark you pick up on really quickly. I always look at this yellow patch. And note Zabulon just lacks the, the black veins through the hind wing. Getting back to the females, uh, female Zabulon, beautiful above, and it's also very distinctive uh, below, and it's also very distinctive above, has very brilliant white marks. Uh, they are not glassy like in a glassy wing. Uh, they're just flat white marks. Uh, and also you can see the white upper edge to the hind wing in this view. Uh, the Pocahontas Hobomock, which is also dark, uh, has very blurry marks. They're, you know, they may be a little bit yellowish, but they aren't these bold white squarish marks that Zabulon has. And of course, this lacks the outer white edge to the hind wing. So easy to tell female Zabulon from female Hobomoke, Pocahontas. Uh, here's now Hobo and Zabulon are pretty common. Uh, here's something that's not very common. Roadside skipper is becoming harder and harder to find. Um, this has two broods, mid-May to mid-June and late July to mid-August. Uh, but this is another uh, species that you have to go to its habitat to find it, which again is similar to cobweb, uh, dry, disturbed, open areas um, with grasses. Um, and up here, frequently ridge tops are a good example, uh, occasionally in power lines. But it's, it's a tiny little thing. It's very small, <laughs> not as tiny as least skipper, but it's small and it's dark and it flies very low. And you could mistake it for a fly moving around uh, the woodland path that you're walking on or the, the power line you're walking on. It's, it's almost, it's easy to miss. But it's a, it's a little dark butterfly with conspicuous frosting when it's fresh and also conspicuous checkered fringes. Here's where fringes come into play that I mentioned before. Checkered being blocks of dark, blocks of light, blocks of dark, blocks of light. Um, and in this case, this is a bracelet on this roadside skipper and it's particularly um, conspicuous on a roadside skipper, um, much more than almost any other species. It's very bright white and it really catches your attention. You see this very small dark butterfly with that white speck on it and that's a, that catches your attention. Uh, the sexes are similar above in this case. Uh, the bracelet again is conspicuous from above and hard to see here, but there are two small spots um, in the center of the forewing. Otherwise it's pretty dull. But most often, I don't recall seeing many roadsides basking. You almost always see them like this. Pepper and salt. Um, this is another butterfly you're not going to find everywhere. Um, it tends to be in open habitats near wetlands or water. Uh, feeds on a, the caterpillars feed on a variety of grasses, uh, both wetland and upland grasses. Uh, so technically it could be found in a variety of habitats, but it's just not that common. And some populations you know, are usually small and some seem to be uh, declining sharply. But it's very distinctive. Uh, it's covered with dense gray green flecking all over the forewing and the hindwing. Again, checkered fringes, much like the roadside skipper. And both wings have uh, numerous creamy white spots. Um, in the hind wing, they tend to form somewhat concentric bands here and here. Again, sex is similar above, like roadside. Uh, they're very they're dark above, and sh both sexes in this case is, show a row of marks, like or pale marks across the mid wing. And the, the uh, fringes may also be very conspicuous when it's open like that. And notice a really good place to find pepper and salt skipper is on wild geranium. It seems to be one of their favorite nectar plants. Long dash comes out in late May. Uh, pretty beautiful little butterfly, uh, kind of bright yellowish brown. Uh, the distinctive thing is this really broad band of spots across the hind wing below. 
It's mostly, notice there's a smooth curve to the outer edge of this band, and there's also a central spot here. Um, the male tends to be this yellowish brown, whereas the female can be considerably darker. The, the uh, non-yellow parts could be a darker brown. Uh, most often confused with Indian skipper, but really easily told because the, the hindwing markings on Indian are very blocky and the lower two are displaced inward, unlike the very smooth band of a long dash, which, which none of the spots are displaced. Now above, long dash, the male has a long dash. That's just what it's named for. This is the stigma toward the base of the wing. Then there's another patch beyond that that uh, is called the long dash. And also very distinctively, the yellow patch on the hind wing above has a dark band across it and also dark veins running lengthwise. Uh, that's a good differentiation with, uh, with Indian. The female on, also has a mark that somewhat looks like the male's long dash, although this part is not a stigma. Females never have stigmas. Uh, she also has a similar hind wing marking where you can see the, the patch is vaguer, but you can see that it's crossed by uh, some dark scales. And her marks are, tend to be yellow. Okay, let's go to some smaller guys. The least skipper, this is our pretty much our smallest butterfly. Um, it, this flies uh, in May, but, and I, but I'm putting European, which usually starts in June, but occasionally you'll get uh, early ones in May uh, because these two are very often confusing to people. Uh, Lee skipper is really tiny. Um, uh, it's very small. It has rounded wings, which are very distinctive when it's at rest. Um, and I, I haven't seen this <laughs> as, a, as a field mark, but I noticed from these photographs and others that I looked at that it has really bold checkering on the uh, antennal clubs. And also even its legs are black and white. Not the clubs. I'm sorry, the stalks of the antenna. And whereas European um, is larger, noticeably larger than Lee Skipper uh, has much more pointed wings. Um, if it's a real mark, it has subtle, only subtle marks on the antennal stalks. Um, and the female uh, has grayish overscaling. So she looks a, a fair amount different. She could look like a faded Delaware maybe, but um, this, this gray color really doesn't appear on a Delaware. Now, looking at them above, uh, very different. European basically looks all orange. Uh, male and female are very similar, except that the male has a little thin stigma that you could hardly notice. And they have very narrow black borders with a little black going up the veins. Compared to least, which really looks dark above, even though this shows quite a bit of orange, when it flies, it looks like it's dark above. Uh, and very often the forewing is entirely black and there's just a patch on the orange patch on the hind wing. But the really distinctive thing is that the abdomen is orange and has a dark stripe down the middle. That does not occur on European, which is dark and hairy looking. Uh, so they are easily told apart, uh, both above and below. Um, Lee skipper te also tends to be a wetland related species. Uh, it feeds on a lot of wetland grasses. Uh, whereas European is found in upland fields. So they do separate fairly well by habitat. Indian skipper. Uh, this is the one that looks a little like a long dash, but again, the hind wing chevron has two spots displaced inward. And, and in the female, the chevron spots are very sharply defined. They're sort of squarish or rectangular compared to the male, where it has the same pattern, but it's very vaguely defined and blurry looking, a little hard to see. And sometimes these spots, as is in this lower photograph, are very distinctly scalloped at the rear edges. Uh, yeah, this is a female with this big fat abdomen. 
that's another way you can frequently tell males and females. Females are loaded with eggs and often have very swollen looking abdomens. And here, just for comparison again, is long dash with its nice smoothly curved uh, spot band on the hind wing compared to the blocky, inwardly displaced chevron on Indian. And another May, June species. And this is a, a skipper that you're going to find basically in upland fields. Here is, it is above. The male has a very narrow stigma, very conspicuously surrounded by a large orange field and a couple of isolated dots near the forewing apex. Uh, the female, a little more boldly marked, it doesn't have the stigma, but it has this very distinctive uh, semicircular dark patch here. And the trailing edges of her orange patch and the forewing above are scalloped, very distinctively scalloped. And unlike Long Dash, uh, she has, or neither one has a dark band across the hind wing above. This is Long Dash on the left down here. So quite distinctively different. Big uh, stigma and patch in the Long Dash, a little skinny stigma in Indian skipper males. So pretty easy. Pex, one of our most common skippers particularly in North Jersey, a little less common in South Jersey. Um, uh, common inhabitant of uh, mostly upland fields, but sometimes you can find it in wetlands. It loves to come to garden flowers, as you can see down here. Uh, bright reddish brown with bright yellow patches, usually divided by uh, a br irregular brown uh, line. But sometimes the, the, this pattern is quite variable. And sometimes uh, this is almost missing. Um, but always this central spot projects to the rear in Peck Skipper, which makes it pretty easy. And this is also pretty small. Um, you see a tiny little, it's bigger than at least Skipper, but it's pretty small. Uh, above, um, I, in females in particular, uh, always look checkerboardy to me. They have a lot of spots. <laughs> uh, she has a little color along the costa. Uh, she has a bracelet. She has spots near the wing apex and several spots across the uh, mid wing and then a couple of costal spots. And plus the, the uh, uh, pattern below is mirrored on the hind wing above. So this is a darkish little butterfly with a lot of spots, a lot of square spots which I always think checkerboard when I look at one, That's, it just works for me. Uh, the male is quite different, but also pretty easy. Uh, he has a stigma and there's orange above the stigma along the costa, but below there's this very distinctive oval brown patch that's attached to the stigma and no other skipper has that. Uh, and he as well mirrors the, um, the pattern from the uh, hind wing below when you see the hind wing above. So Pex is a, a pretty easy little skipper. Now tawny edge and cross line give some people fits. <laughs> uh, tawny edge is very small, um, Pex size if not smaller. Uh, cross line is a little bigger and you have to become a little sensitive to that difference in size. But there are many other differences as well. Tawny edge is named for this, this bright tawny edge to the costa. Uh, when seen below, which strongly contrasts with the kind of dullish brown hind wing, which occasionally has a faint crescent of spots uh, compared to cross line, which in which there is very little contrast between forewing and hind wing. The forewing does not have that orange along the costa. And if cross line has a spot crescent, it's straight rather than uh, curved as in tawny edge. So they're, they're uh, fairly easy to tell apart below. It seems sometimes here in uh, the later brood, particularly, we often see it's very orangey below. The, the two wings are almost identical. And we're always thinking, what the heck is that thing? And we usually decide that's a tawny edge. But size alone is a really big help in differentiating them. Above, seen this picture before, this is 
uh, the Costa shows above just as well. Uh, very, very orangey. Uh, and the you have to compare the stigmas on tawny edge and cross line. On tawny edge, the stigma is pretty much the same thickness along its entire length. And it more or less parallels the edge of the Costa. Whereas in cross line, the stigma tapers toward the body very distinctively. And it also does not parallel the costa, it crosses the forewing, hence the name cross line skipper. That's where that name comes from. And so almost in, in, uh, aside from looking at the stigma itself, that gives cross line a very distinctive triangular orange patch in the forewing, the front part of the forewing. Um, but if you take a closer look, you'll see the tapering stigma. Then furthermore, Tony Edge has a single keyhole spot at the end of the stigma, a little orange spot, whereas cross line has two spots. And I always think of the two S's in cross line as being spot, spot, it has two spots. <laughs> I have to think of silly mnemonics like that for certain things, it just will not stick in my head. Um, but that works fairly well. The two females above are a little more difficult. Uh, they really are quite similar. Uh, Tawny edge is easy if the costa is fairly bright because cross line does not have a bright costa. Uh, they have similar markings across the hind wing. They have a bracelet and a couple of pale marks. Um, to, uh, cross line occasionally has um, more marks than a tawny edge. Uh, but the female, that's an admittedly different, difficult pair. And again, you may be thinking of size on this one. How big is it? Swarthy skipper, denizen of dry, grassy fields, uh, not very common, uh, very local. Uh, this has two broods, late May to early July, August to mid-September. Uh, this is rather uncommon and local in North Jersey, but it can become very common in South Jersey, <laughs> uh, where there's a lot more suitable habitat. This is probably our least distinctive skipper. I <laughs> uh, have to develop a feel for this kind of uh, yellowish brown color or sandy brown color with just the pale veins. Sometimes they're more distinctive than this. Um, but you kind of, okay, this is an unmarked skipper and there aren't too many that really have no marks below. Uh, so that's a pretty good clue, uh, uh, along with it being in a dry grassy habitat. And above it's equally, unmarked. It's really dark above. Uh, doesn't show any color except a little bit along the, just inside the costa of the hind wing. Um, completely unmarked blackish brown. It's small and it's inconspicuous and easy to miss, but it's always fun to see it. Uh, we often see this on our trips to Bamboo Brook. Little glassy wing, uh, really common butterfly uh, coming out in late May, flies to mid-August. Uh, this is a dark brown little gem, uh, which is becomes fairly distinctive uh, once you get a feel for this crescent of spots. Um, whenever I see it, I, it just strikes me as that it's very irregular. In this picture, it looks fairly regular, but when you get to these two spots here, it starts to look a little fluky. And that just catches your eye, to my eye anyway. And for comparison with other, for example, a female dun that might have a crescent on it. And occasionally this might have the costal spot. But one of the big helps, which Jeff in particular helpfully points out, is the white at the base of the antenna club. Uh, this is not the only skipper that has that, but it really does show up distinctively on the little glassy wing. Very dark skipper, um, uneven spot band, white before the antennal clubs. Uh, becomes pretty distinctive to find. And it's so common that you get to see a lot of them. <laughs> and that helps to uh, hone your identification skills. Looking at it above, uh, Glacing is also pretty easy because it has very flashy, glassy marks, meaning transparent marks in the hind wing. Uh, the female has a, a very large squarish mark in the array of marks across the forewing, 
whereas the male has a keyhole mark here and then a more rectangular mark that's more crossways rather than lengthwise. You can see this female's mark is a little bit more rectangular than square, but it's the corners are square off. Uh, whereas his is a little more irregular and it's turned to be across the wing a little bit more, just below the stigma. So glassy wing, um, you could confuse this with a female Zabulon maybe, who has also flashy white marks, uh, but they're not glassy marks. And female Zabulon has that white edge to the hind wing, remember. And not too many males look like a male glassy wing, that's for sure. And Dunskipper, another pretty dull one, but as you'll see in the above shots, uh, fresher ones, it can be really a very attractive butterfly when it's fresh. Uh, it's basically all dark, uh, male in particular. Uh, the female may occasionally have a faint hind wing spot band, and I think males very occasionally as well. It's usually very faint and poorly defined. Uh, you wouldn't confuse it with the glassy wing, which is a much more well-defined spot band. And of course, this lacks white before the antennal clubs. So it's pretty much a pretty nondescript dark skipper, both above. Um, below, here's a nice fresh male. You can see he's really glistening, um, very handsome, but he has no markings above, basically. Uh, the female, on the other hand, does have a little two-spot bracelet. Most of the bracelets we've seen have been three. Hers is two, and she has two um, little blurry white marks in the forewing. And the innermost one is often distinctively crescent-shaped. Uh, that may help because there's a lot of female skippers with white marks across the forewing. So any distinctive mark among those is uh, always helpful. Uh, coming to and we have from Peter Post this really gorgeous um, male with the tip typical or frequently occurring golden head and thorax. Um, not all, as you can see, they don't. There's a perfectly fresh one with photo and doesn't really show that gold, uh, but some of them really do. This one looks like it was dipped in gold, uh, and is you know just a really beautiful specimen. And when you see that, that's a really um, helpful characteristic, but just seeing an all dark uh, skipper above is a pretty good clue that you've got uh, a dun. Um, duns tend to be, they, they feed on, caterpillars feed on uh, sedges. All the preceding uh, skippers we've seen have been grass feeders. Uh, so dun skipper feeding on sedges is a little more frequently found near wetlands where uh, many sedges grow. So we've covered enough of skippers for now. This is part one. That was 15 early flying skippers. Um, but there's a lot more to come <laughs> in May. And uh, we will pick up the pace. So any questions? Oh, do I have to unmute? Uh, 